Welcome back to the Relentless Minds podcast. I am your host, Lori Jimenez. I created this platform with a sole mission, and that is to inspire people of all backgrounds to create the change they wish to see in their lives and in the world by sharing the examples of those who are. As a listener, you will hear the stories of ordinary men and women with extraordinary stories of overcoming adversities in order to experience the life they dream of. All of these individuals share a common interest. They desire a change for the better, and they are in a relentless pursuit to create that for themselves. If you're looking for inspiration to overcome challenges in your own life, to create a life that you desire to have, then you have come to the right place. You see, the truth is, people everywhere are fighting for what they believe in. And together, with relentless action and mental strength, I have no doubt that we can fulfill that dream. On December 16, 2014, a terrible event occurred in Peshawar, Pakistan, which disturbed the country deeply. Its effects were felt across the world, and it turned out to be the fourth largest school massacre in the history of the world. On this day, a terrorist group of seven men invaded an army public school of Peshawar and shot and killed 149 people. 134 of those lives lost were children between the ages of 8 and 18. 112 more people were injured. Walid Khan is a survivor of the attack but did not get away unscathed. He suffered six bullet wounds to the face and two shots to the body. His doctors and family did not believe he would survive, but miraculously he did. He was 12 years old at the time. Walid now is 17 years old, and today on this episode he shares his experience of that terrible day and what he had to deal with in the aftermath of it all. Walid also discusses the amazing transformation he underwent once he discovered a new purpose that gave him hope and created a desire to use his experience to help change the lives of others by sharing his story and a powerful message of peace. Hi, Walid. Thank you so much for being here today with us to share your story on surviving one of the deadliest school massacres in the history of the world. I wanted to tell you that I believe that what you are doing just five years after the incident to spread the message of peace is absolutely inspiring. And I feel honored to be able to have this interview with you today. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. And it's an honor for me to be here. And thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So Walid, I would first like to ask you about your childhood before the attack. How was it for you growing up in Pakistan? And how were you as a child? So uh, growing up in Pakistan was like uh, a normal a normal life that a, an Asian or subcontinental kid would have. So, you know, being passionate about cricket, you know, cricket is being famous there and being in love with Bollywood movies. And uh, that, was, that was just a normal childhood. And yeah. I you uh, I used to go to military school there since my since kindergarten and uh I was I was in that school for 10 years and uh it it was life was quite good before the incident and life was uh going normally because uh although there were terrorist attacks in Pakistan at that time and the situation was really bad but you know as I said I was I was just uh, a normal teenager and maybe I was just so busy in my life, in studies, in sports, and with friends that I didn't realize that what was happening around me. Mm-hmm. And although the the people around me, like the elders and my parents and my uncles and aunties, they they they, they do they did realize that you know what was happening around. But we kids, we were just busy in our lives and we didn't really worry because my mom would sometimes get worried about me like you know if i go out somewhere or my dad would get worried about it and they but i I thought like that's that that's normal because every parent would do that but uh we didn't realize that the situation in pakistan especially in peshawar where i lived like it was the southern part of pakistan and it was really badly affected by terrorism at that time so the situation they were like since 2009, there were bomb blasts on daily basis. Like there would be bomb blasts every day. Uh, we would hear, hear in news. And my parents would keep me away from like all my brothers and sisters. We all, they would keep us away from the news and all those things because they didn't want us to get affected by it or to get traumatized by it. So unless uh, we grew up a little bit more and then I started watching like news and... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, 
the first time when I realized that the actual thing that was happening around us was like the situation was really bad was when one of my neighbors heard, like there was there was a uh, uh, there was a house in our neighborhood and some of their members they they got killed in a terrorist attack in a bomb blast and uh, on that day like the whole like you know area where I lived it was like there were so many people standing there and they were like bringing their dead bodies and then and that day I realized that you know something is happening wrong in here like you know until that I didn't realize that what was happening around me because I was just busy in my cricket life my mm -hmm. school life or talking about wrestling because uh me and my brothers we would like <clears throat> watch wrestling and then <clears throat> we would do like boxing and wrestling mm -hmm. all the time like uh yeah like annoying and we would sometimes annoy our sisters so that's <laughs> you were living a normal childhood life but at the same time it seems like this threat around you guys was a daily threat when it yeah obviously it was but as i said like uh, i never really realized it mm -hmm. because uh when 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 you were sort of a teenager or when you were like a child so you don't really like you know focus on the things around you and maybe sometimes you do but you know when you're really busy with your life and my whole like focus and as i said like our parents would keep us away from yes. those kind of things so they didn't mm -hmm. want us to get affected by it in any way okay. so they were like they won't allow us to go outside even if i would go outside i would go outside with my dad or with my mom or with my elder brother so mm -hmm. it was it was kind of like that that you know there would be someone who will be assisting us and to go out and uh in in public mm -hmm. places whenever we would go to school uh sometimes our mom would get worried like you know yeah uh, the situation was like really critical so if you would go out on a certain day and the your family members would be worried all with it whether he will come back or not mm -hmm. this was but you know the school where I was, like army public school, like milit it was a military school. It was in a cantonment area. So no one really thought that, you know, this kind of things would happen there because that was the only area which was kind of safe yeah. at that time mm -hmm. and which wasn't really attacked by the terrorists. So. so it was a surprise what happened on that day in December 2014. Can you tell us about that can you tell us about the day of the attack how did the morning begin and what was going on at school that day so it was it was just a normal morning like you know like we used to have like daily it was just uh i woke up in the morning and uh I, on that day i was actually feeling ill and i was not feeling really well so my mom told me like you know you don't go to school today and i was like no nah, uh because you know uh, my little brother, my younger brother, he used to go with me to the same school. So he was in the toddler section and I was in the secondary school section. So our school was quite a big school. We had uh, a primary school in there. We had a college in there. We had a secondary school in there. So it, it was quite a big And it was one of the biggest schools in the city and in the province of KPA. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, uh, my as i said like i wasn't feeling well and i was i was uh i had like a fever i had a bit of fever and my mom was like you you shouldn't you're not looking well today so don't go to school today but then i said to my mom that no nah, if if i say like i won't go to school then my little brother he will also like you know insist and start crying that i'm not going to school so i don't want that mess right now so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm 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 all right to go to school so yeah i just uh we just went to school, like uh, our van picked us up and we used to go in a van and then we uh, went to school. And at school, like normally I met all my friends in the morning. We used to meet in the cafeteria. So we used to have, sometimes we used to have breakfast together because we would go so much earlier in the morning that it would be like 6.30 or sometimes 7 or so. It would be like too early so we would have breakfast together all all my friends and me and we would sit in the cafeteria and sometimes talk about cricket talk about politics mm -hmm. talk about uh uh different issues talk about wrestling so uh i had like on that morning i had breakfast with my friends on on that day and in the 
and all our friends. We were sitting in there. We just had a great time as always, and we, mm-hmm. we had laughter. We had uh, we were cra- cracking jokes on each other, and uh, yeah. So we started the morning uh, lessons as well. So our school started and our lessons started. And we attended our first two lessons. When we attended our first two lessons, after that, uh, I was I was the head boy at that time. I was the head boy of the school wing, and my teachers uh, told me like basically that I have to take all the students to the auditorium because there was going to be a first aid lecture. So mm-hmm. they told me to take all the students to the auditorium. Uh, three days before the incident, we had a sports gala, so we had like a sports week for the whole week, and uh, no one was really interested in like you know studying and taking lessons. So when I told them this that we are going to the auditorium and we're gonna miss lessons today, and we are having a first aid lecture, so everyone started like cheering up. They're and everyone all excited. Was, yeah, everyone was really excited to me, <laughs> and they they all started like you know going towards the auditorium and. Uh, yeah, we, we went to the auditorium and all of them like settled down there chatting with each other. I still remember those moments. Uh, I was I was walking around because I, I, I had to maintain discipline in the in the auditorium. I was the head boy. So uh, everyone was like my friends, like, you know, they were they were making weird faces to make me laugh because I was in this on, on the stage. So they were trying to make me laugh and all that. So and you got to be on stage because you were the head boy which is a more privileged position you're like an exemplary yeah. uh, model student right Yeah so you were so, on stage during the first aid training lecture Yeah so an army uh, major like uh, he was an army doctor and he was a major he came to give us the first aid lecture and and training on first aid lecture and he was uh, the lecture started and the lecture was going on really well and uh like some students they were making fun of like you know they were they were messing around i i, I still remember one of my friends uh he attacked unfortunately but he was he was the naughtiest guy in the school and even though a few minutes before that attack only a few minutes before that attack uh he made uh he cracked a joke on the on the doctor that came to gave us the first a lecture and everyone started laughing it was because uh the doctor was telling us about like the abc of first aid is different from the normal abc and then he told us the abbreviations of it and then he asked us the question again that what does a stands for and he shouted out apple <laughs> he shouted out apple yeah and every, <laughs> everyone in the auditorium started laughing and that got like the mm. major mood was a bit off after that but yeah, yeah. we still made managed to yeah what what were the first signs that um something bad was taking place so that it was the time when after that a few minutes after that as i said there was a loud deafening so- uh, sound and some of the students in the auditorium got scared and like you know they jumped like you know when they heard the sound so others started laughing at them that you know you got scared of a sound you got scared of that sound so they all there was again laughter in the auditorium and then those sounds were getting consistent and louder and louder and then uh some of the students they were still not taking it seriously because it was a military school so those kind of sounds were kind of normal we thought it might be a military drill or a few days before the attack we had our seniors like the students from the college wing they they were trying to prank us, so they threw some firecrackers in the auditorium. And I thought we thought like it, it might be one of those pranks mm. that they're pranking us, or it might be one of the military drills. Mm. But then those sounds started getting even more louder and louder. And everyone, then uh, there was like kind of complete silence in the auditorium. And I could see like everyone was then a bit worried, like what's happening? Like this is not normal. And uh, our teachers. Uh, started talking to each other they started like you know whispering with each other I don't know what were they talking about but they started whispering with each other and they suddenly locked all the doors in the auditorium auditorium had basically had like eight to ten doors and they locked all the doors and uh, I I just looked at one of my teacher and he was standing there I was still standing on the stage and uh I asked him like what's happening I just looked at him and he was like don't worry nothing is happening calm down don't worry there's nothing and I was like all right and 
then they told all the students to go under their chairs like the teachers they told all the students to go under their chairs and again i looked at the same teacher and i, I asked him like why are you telling us to go under under the chairs if you are saying that everything is fine mm-hmm. and he was like don't worry calm down it's just it's just for like you know it's just mm-hmm. it's nothing and uh everything will be fine and i did the, the the thing i did was like i didn't go under under the chair and i was still standing there and all of a sudden after after one or two minutes when i had this conversation with my teacher i saw a few men like at the back door of the auditorium because you could see the back door of the auditorium had the doors which had like kind of window it was kind mm-hmm. of window door so like it has a uh, glass over it so you could see who is coming from outside and inside so mm-hmm. i saw these few men outside the door and when they realized that the door was locked they started kicking it they kicked it once and when they kicked it twice they, they broke the door and they came inside as they came inside they started shouting and they they said like allahu akbar and they started firing and at that time i was i was like i was i was in a shock i was in a complete shock and, and you were on stage at this point watching that yeah I just I just got shocked like my body just paralyzed I couldn't move I was I was like what's happening and who are these people and why are they shouting like and they had guns and they started shooting all of a sudden and they shot my friends and I couldn't believe my eyes like what was happening I was I was just I couldn't like at that time I couldn't digest it like what was going around my, there were many questions in my mind and there was no answer to it i was just shocked and i couldn't move like i was just standing there and i was just looking like i was just looking at them and just standing there what was and suddenly one of them aimed his gun towards me and he shot me on the face and when he shot me with the first bullet i fell down on the floor and it was extremely painful because with that bullet my maxilla was broken base of nose was my bro- was broken and my face opened up totally my face opened up and my teeth were broken so uh i tried to put my hand on my face but my face was open so my hand went inside my face so i couldn't stop the the blood coming out and it it just opened up and i was i was in extreme pain and i i was shouting and i was uh i was just screaming and i was crying like uh I wasn't believing it. I was telling myself that please it's a dream. Please wake up. It's a dream. It can't be true. I like no, it's it's not it's not true. I can't die so easily. My friends can't die so easily. Like a few minutes before we were just chilling here. We were just joking around and then like all of a sudden what has happened like my friend died in front of my eyes like the ones I saw they were shot down. They were dying in front of my eyes. They shot them on the heads. They shot them on their hearts and I wasn't understand what was happening around me. I was thinking it's a dream. I was I, I was I was telling myself that please wake up, please, please. And unfortunately it wasn't. But I was crying there. I laid down for a moment. I was crying there and I was screaming and one of the terrorists saw me that I was still alive so they came and they shot me again. They shot according to my doctors I was shot 8 times. I don't I didn't I didn't know how many times at that time they shot me because I I didn't realize but according to my doctors I was shot 8 times and uh and six, six of this sh- mm-hmm. yeah six of this was on my face and one was one of one of them was on my hand and the other was on my legs so I was I was like I'm not going to survive after this I lost totally I totally lost all the hopes when they shot me for the second time I was like I'm not going to survive after this. Is that what you were thinking at that time yeah. while you were being shot? When they shot me after that, when they left me there and when they shot me, I was like this there's no way I can survive now. There's no way. I I was like this is the end for me. Like I was crying, I was crying. I was I was I I will be honest, I was scared and I was crying. I was I I, I was scared of that at that time because I was I was miss, missing my mom. I was I was just imagining her face and i was just praying to god like just for the last time just for for a little bit like just for the last time i want to see her and and you I, were at this time 12 years old right yeah and i i was just 
I was just looking at my friends because my friends on my face was towards them. There were also there were their dead bodies around me, and I I couldn't like. I couldn't do anything for them, and I couldn't do anything for myself. I was helpless myself, and I was just crying. It was it was one of the worst experiences, one of mm-hmm. the worst times one could ever have in their life. But what one of the, one of the terrorists, like those terrorists, they were walking around at that time. They were walking around in the auditorium, and they were hitting everyone with the guns, and they were kicking everyone. They were they were they were checking everyone whether they were still alive or not. And one of them, they kicked me on my chest they kicked me on my chest and to check whether i was still alive or not i don't know what maybe my face was open i don't know why they left me but maybe my face because my face at that time was totally opened up and i was fully covered with blood and they just kicked me and they just left me there they kicked me on my chest and left me there because of that my lungs my lungs were damaged and I was I was lying there for a moment. But maybe, I was maybe they that. thought. Did you think that they thought that because of the condition that you were in, that you would just die on your own? Maybe that's what I was thinking. That they might they might have been thinking that I would die soon, so they left me. Uh, they 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 after that they left the auditorium because I I was lying I was lying down there in the auditorium and. I could be, at that time, I was really, really lucky that my senses were still working. I could still hear things. I could still see things. Mm-hmm. And I could still think. I, w- I was really, really fortunate that my senses were working. And I didn't lose full consciousness. Although my eyes were getting closed because of the blood loss. Uh, and and the swelling. Uh, yeah. And I was, I was in extreme pain. I was in extreme pain. At first, uh, I heard a few students who survived in the auditorium they were whispering to each other and they were like they are gone they are gone they were they were and they uh started running towards the school wing because the auditorium was between the college wing and the school wing so the terrorists went towards the college wing because they killed all the, they killed almost all the students who were in the school wing they were in the auditorium so they went towards the college wing too how many students were you were in that auditorium that day do you have an idea I think it would probably because it was year eight, year nines, year tens, and yeah, it was it was three years. So that it it would probably be around like five hundred, four hundred, and the thing was that when they left the auditorium, at that time I I saw people running around. I saw the students running around. Because they were running around from the back door, from the front door, they were they were like eight to ten doors, as I said, in the auditorium. So they were they were like about four to five doors towards the school wing. So they all started running towards the school wing. And at that time, I was I was I was begging for help. I was asking for help because I tried to raise my hand and I tried to like ask everyone like who was running around. I was help. I was asking for help that someone. Uh, if someone will help me, and I was, I was holding, I was, I was trying to hold one of their hands, but they were running around, so I couldn't, I couldn't hold their hands, and I was trying to speak, I was trying to say things, but as I said, like my face was badly damaged, my, my teeth were not there, my maxilla, my jaw was broken, the base of my nose was broken, so I couldn't speak, although I was trying to, but I couldn't, and I was swallowing my blood, I was. In a, I, was, I was lying in a position where I was swallowing. But I, when I would tr- try to talk, I would swallow my blood. So exactly. I, was, I was asking for help there. And there was no one. Because it wasn't their fault. They were also kids. And they were also in a traumatic situation. Yes. So no one could there really help me. And they were, they were kids. They, they were also traumatized by this thing all of a sudden. So like me. And uh, so... When I realized, at that time, I realized that no one is going to really help me. And I tried to, I tried to stood up. I tried to stood up. I tried to stood up on my feet. At that time, um, I didn't realize that I was shot on my leg and my hand as well. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. And I thought my whole focus and concentration was on my face. Yeah. And I was, I, it was in extreme pain. So I couldn't feel the pain of my leg or my hand. My face was in extreme pain. So... Uh, I didn't realize that I was shot on my leg as well. So when I tried to stand up, 
uh, I tried to take support from the chairs over there. There were chairs, and I tried to stood up. And when I stood up and I tried to take one step, I fell down on the floor. And again, I tried to I, I tried to stood up again, and then again, I would I would fell down on the floor. I I tried it once or twice, and uh, I couldn't stand up. And I was thinking that that's because of my face, and that's because I'm feeling too weak. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's when I loss. yeah. When I saw in the auditorium, when I saw around in the auditorium, you couldn't like you literally couldn't see anything around because because of the gunpowder and all that there was smoke all around auditorium and you couldn't see much and I, I was feeling really thirsty. I still remember I was even though my but I was I was really really thirsty and I, I was I kept on swallowing my blood. I don't know how did you stay awake during this time because losing so much blood and being in a critical position, you could have just lost consciousness at that point. That's so. why I was at that time. That's why I was I was surprised that when I when I stood up in the auditorium, I was like, uh, "How am I doing this?" And I, I, when I was shot on the with the first bullet, I thought that's it. That's the end. But I I, I was trying to convince myself. Uh, when I was lying there, I was trying to convince myself. I was checking my breath. It, it was just, I knew that I, I was alive. But it was just to convince myself that I'm still alive. So I would put my hand on my mouth to see whether I'm still breathing or not. And I would just put this, this on my face and I, was, I would check my breath. And it, this was just to give myself a bit of confidence that, like, you know, that you, yeah, you, you're still alive. You're not dying. You're still there. You're still there. Yeah. You can make it. Keep going. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do there. And, um, there was, there was, and I, I, I kept on thinking about my mom and my friends. I kept on thinking about my friends because I wasn't, my mind still wasn't accepting that thing that they were no more with me. And I tried to, you know, when, when I couldn't walk and when I realized that I, I'm not able to walk, so I tried to crawl and I started crawling. I started crawling like a baby on the floor and, uh, somehow i managed to get out of the auditorium by crawling and uh i went out and i still remember that time when i was in front of the library when i reached because when you go outside the auditorium there's a library mm -hmm. uh, on its side so there was our school library and some of the students most many of the students were hiding in there but the library was closed, so many of the students were hiding inside, and they had put like all the cupboards and all the things on the door so the terrorists can't come in. And uh, I was I was outside, and I was there were some pillars where I tried to took support from those pillars, and I tried to stand up again at that time, and uh, I stood up, and I was holding those pillars. I stood up with the help of those pillars. I was holding them, and. I saw one of the students, I still remember, I saw one of the students running in front of me and I put my hand, I tried to put my hand on his shoulder, I tried to stop him, so I tried to put my hand on his shoulder and he stopped for a moment. When I put my hand on his shoulder, he stopped for a moment, but when he looked back at my face, as I said, I, I, my face was in a really, really critical situation. So he got, he got scared and mm. because he was a kid himself and he was... He got scared. So at that time, I had lost so much blood that I, I only needed a slight push to fall down again. So when he lifted my hand up from his shoulder, when he pulled it up, I, I fell down on the floor again. And then there were some students who were running, who, who just came out from the auditorium. And they, they started running over me because no one realized that I was lying down there. And I tried to move my hands to tell them that I was still alive. But they, they, they ran over my hands and because of that, my hands were badly damaged. My wrist was broken. Uh, when I was left alone there, I still remember that time when I was left alone there, my face was, uh, I could see like, I could see the trees outside. And as I said, our school was really big and you could see, you, we had many trees and gardens in there and grounds in there. So I could see one of the biggest trees in our school from the library. And I could see the tree outside and I could see the birds flying from that tree. And at that time, I, I, wish, I, I made a wish to the God. I was like, I wish I could be, I could be one of those birds and I could fly away from here like this, mm -hmm. like, like them, in the, like, you know, so yes. I, I was thinking like, they're so lucky that, you know, they, they can fly and they can move. 
and I was, I was, I don't know. I was just thinking random stuff. Uh, yes, and you were on the floor. Yeah, and in your condition. And how long do you know if do you know how long was it that it took for you to be rescued? I think it took pro- from the start till the end. It took about like half an hour or like an hour, half an hour or fifty or forty minutes. But the thing was, uh, when I was lying down, like as I said, when I was lying down in uh, in front of the library, and I tried to, there was there was a class like ten to five meters away from that from that. There was an ES seven class, so from there, the distance from the place where I was lying down, it was five to ten meters, and uh, I tried to crawl that distance, and I tried to. Uh, move again i try uh, and i started moving again i was like no i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna give it my best until i'm breathing i'm gonna i'm gonna try to survive that's what i was telling myself that no you have to survive no you have to survive until i'm breathing i'm I'm gonna give it my best and as i said that you know my i was i was really really lucky that my senses were working Mm -hmm. and i could think and i was telling myself these things and i was thinking and by the time I was getting half, un- half I was getting half unconscious. So yeah. you know, uh, my eyes were getting closed. Everything was like seeing blur in front of my eyes, and uh, everything was getting blurry. And uh, when I reached that year seven class, that distance, like ch- crawling that distance, like that ten to five meters, for me at that time it was like traveling like ten thousand miles. It was that hard for me to to do that. Because taking one step in that was was a really really big deal for me, and that distance was really really big for me too. Then when I reached that year seven class, I lost all my strength. I I, I just gave it all, and I lost all my strength. I couldn't move anymore. I couldn't do any movement. Uh, I was I was feeling unconscious. I was half, I was almost half unconscious, and I just laid down in front of the door and. At that time, I realized when I saw, when I looked at my, my legs. So when I looked at my leg, I, I realized that there was a big hole in my leg. And I realized that I was also shot on my leg. At that time, I just realized it. And I was lying there almost for 15 minutes until the rescuers came. Like I was lying there almost for 15 minutes uh, in front of that class. But at that time, I was telling myself, I kept on telling myself that, please, don't get unconscious. If I get unconscious at this time, then whoever like will come to rescue us, they will think that I'm dead and they want to rescue me first. So I was I was trying to keep myself conscious, like at least until their arrival and so that they can see me and they can rescue me. And at that time, I was, as I said, like my eyes were getting closed. So I started hitting the angel leg. I started punching it. So that I can feel more pain, so it can keep me conscious. And I was, I was, I started hitting my injured leg, and uh, I was feeling more pain. Although I already was in in extreme amount of pain, but it was just to keep myself conscious. And as I said, after ten to fifteen minutes, uh, the military came in. They took over the school wing site, and they took me to CMH Combined Military Hospital in Peshawar, and. When I reached the hospital, I still remember that I was I was conscious. I was I was still conscious, but when I, by the time I reached the hospital, my body was fully paralyzed. I was mm-hmm. conscious. I could still hear things. I could still see things, but I could not move any part of my body because of the blood loss. Yeah, and uh, mm-hmm. I wasn't. Uh, I was trying to move, like my hand or my fingers at least to to do some movement, but I couldn't. And. Uh, I could I could like hear things I could see things a bit blurry but I was I was conscious and at that time the doctors thought that when they saw me the doctors thought that because many casualties were coming behind me and it was an emergency situation so the doctors thought that I was dead and they put my body with the other dead bodies and so I was you trying to you weren't unconscious at this point but you could not move so yeah, you I were aware. Move. You were aware of what was going on with you, but you couldn't move your hands. You couldn't move your f- your face. 
yeah that was that was the thing i was aware of the things around me i could see i could see like things blurry and although i couldn't see it clearly but i could see things blurry and i could still hear things like you know mm -hmm. so my 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 hearing and my seeing something are still working and uh but my body was just paralyzed i don't know because of the blood loss and uh when they put my body with the other dead bodies i realized that i knew that they did it and i was trying to i, I was trying to tell them i was trying to at least do some movement at least move my fingers so they could see me like i'm still doing movement. because at that time as i said it was an emergency situation so they had to make decisions quickly it wasn't even okay. there for they, they they because there were so many casualties on, the, on on that day there were like hundreds of casualties and there was so Yes, there uh, was 149 people that lost their lives that day. So they were having a lot of people and 112 that were injured, apparently. So a lot of people were coming into the hospital. Yeah, definitely. So that, that was the thing that, you know, they had to quickly make decisions. And I was, I was one of the first ones to be rescued, according to the doctors. Mm -hmm. when, when I was talking to them, like, you know, when I had meetings with them lately, when I got like better, so they, they used to tell me about it. And... Uh, so this mm. this was the when I don't know I I took a so all of a sudden I took a long breath I I just took a long breath like and blood bubbles starting coming out from my mouth that you know bubbles of blood because my face was fully covered with blood mm. and fortunately one of the nurses saw me there she saw the bubbles coming out from my mouth and uh, she quickly called the doctors and she was like I could see the bubbles and then they took me to the operation theater and after that. Uh, I just lost my consciousness. I don't know. Wow. They gave me anesthesia, and I was unconscious. I was in coma for eight days. Wow! So you had kept yourself conscious all this time, and then when they found you, and they gave you some anesthesia, you let go and you fell into a coma at that point. Yeah, and wow. I was at that at that time. I also felt. You know, there there was this this belief in my heart somehow at that time. I don't know. There was somewhere this belief that you know I'm gonna survive. I'm gonna survive. And now when I reached that that operation theater, I was like, now I'm gonna survive. I don't know. There was this maybe after it was hard for me after going through all this experience, and and this was the only time when I felt a bit a bit of relief that yeah, um, I can survive now. There's still chance. So, yeah, this, this, was, this was it. That's incredible. I want to just say this. So, since that day, it's been about five years. Is that right? Yeah. It's been about five years. And in that time, Almost. you've had to undergo a lot of facial reconstruction. You have to do surgeries. You started first in Pakistan. Then you had to be transported to Birmingham for some additional services just because – or additional sur – surgeries because in Pakistan the technology wasn't advanced enough to treat your case and in all of this time this you know you're alive and that's incredible and I'm sure you know this your family know this but it's the chances of you being alive today is a miracle it was and indeed according even according to my doctors because in as i said like i didn't know that what was happening in the in those eight days but according to my family and according to the doctors i, I was battling between life and death the doctors were, were giving like every day the doctors would get give an ultimatum like because i was on the ventilator and i was in coma mm -hmm. and they would give an ultimatum to my family like a time span that if he doesn't get conscious in this time it means like we're going to turn off the ventilator and he can't survive anymore so my family, my mom, my dad, uh, except for my mom, sorry, not my mom, my dad and my brothers, on, they had already accepted that, you know, I wasn't going to survive. My family were like mentally kind of prepared for that. But the only person who wasn't accepting it was my mom. And she was there and she was like, they had to keep her, they also had to keep her unconscious and keep her like, you know, uh, on sleep for six days, like every day, because she, if they, they said like they they told her like in the start my my dad and my brother like according to them they told her like you know I was only shot on my leg and they were like yeah it's it's a uh, 
you know, it's a minor injury and don't worry. But, you know, she knew that something was wrong. And she she didn't wanted... know that you were shot in your face six, for, six times for, all, for days. She didn't yeah. know that? But she had a doubt. She was like, no, it's something is serious. And she was like, I want to go to the hospital and meet him. I want to meet him. Why, why aren't you allowing me to meet him if this is a minor injury? And they weren't allowing him. They, they, the doctors were like, if she, if she sees him in this, in this thing, it means that because my mom was also traumatically really like she had a mental breakdown after hearing all that and uh, the doctors were like if she sees her him in this in this situation we 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 think that she's not gonna have like you know she's not gonna survive as well if she sees him in this situation she's gonna have a, a, a severe mental breakdown and it would be really hard to do so they had to like keep her unconscious my family for six days so that you know she doesn't ask for me. but she was still hopeful she was she would pray day and night that you know he's gonna survive and on the eighth day when i get conscious when i got conscious and when i opened my eyes because my my face was at first my family didn't recognize me because my face was fully covered with bandages and uh, my body was swollen so you know uh I, at that time, as I was 12 years old, but, you know, I was, I was really young. And if your body gets swollen, so you look like, you know, quite, uh, you know, uh, old. So, you know, I was, my family was like, no, that's not him. He's, he's, he's really little and he's really young. And uh, it was because my whole body was swollen and my face was like, you know, unrecognizable. My face was fully covered with bandages. Oh, wow. My wow. dad recognized me with, uh, with, uh, with a sweater, like the sweater he gave me three days before he recognized me with that sweater when he was they found me at night time according to my dad they found me in the icu at night time at 10 p.m and they were looking for me in the dead bodies in the injured and they were looking for me in the hospitals and there was a time when because uh, later like my dad told me and my family told me all the stories that they that happened on that day and they were like they were looking for me everywhere and there was a time that my dad just like you know gave up he was like i can't find him like when he was going through the dead bodies he had he he felt unconscious quite a few times he got unconscious and so that was the thing that you know he uh but he still had to do it he still didn't he was still looking for me and all my family friends they all were looking for me it was it was just like the worst day in the history of Pakistan and in the history of Peshawar. Everyone, the roads were blocked. Everyone was running around here and there. And it was, it was just like a hell on that day in, in yeah. the city. Uh, yeah. I know that that, um, that event caused a lot of, of consequences politically in, in your country. Um, decisions that were made against the terrorists um, and the, and the uh, organization. Um, and I, you know, I'd like for us to tap into that shortly, but I wanted to ask you when it came to your recovery and getting through this, this period, because after you woke up from the coma, there was now this next chapter of your life that you had to figure out what you were going to do. So I wanted to ask you how you were able, like what helped you through this time, through this recovery period, um, no. to just cope and to go on with your life? At first, uh, I'll be honest, you know, when I, for the first time when I, when I got conscious, I tried to run away from the hospital because I was still in that traumatic situation and I tried to remove all the pipes and bandages from me. So the doctors had to tie my hands with bandages so that I don't hurt myself. And they tied me up with bandages, they t tied my hands and my legs. So. Uh, I was trying to run away and they had to like keep me unconscious like they had to give me anesthesia for the first time when I woke up and when I got conscious but for the second time what they did they brought in my mom and my sister and my uncle so that I can see my family members and I can relax a bit and at that time when I saw my mom for the first time uh, although I couldn't speak my 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 voice was gone and I don't know they they did something with it uh, I couldn't speak and I couldn't say anything and I was just uh, 
using my hands to 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 do movements and to tell my mom was and at at first my mom told me when she met, met me uh she told me that you know I, I had an she was trying to divert my attention and she was like you had an accident on a bike and I was like no I uh, I just pointed out like you know I just made a gun with my hand and I was like no I was shot with the gun and yeah, yeah she, she told the doctors look he knows it was maybe the doctors who told her like you know just try to divert his attention and i saw my mom and i held her hand so tightly at that time uh, i held her hand in my hand because she was not allowed to touch me she was not allowed to uh, no one was allowed to come closer to me at that time so i just held my mom's hand and i i was crying i was crying i wanted to hug her but i couldn't i had so many injuries so it was really hard uh for her as well and she she tried to control herself she tried to not to cry but i could still see her crying and she would like uh you, you so i because i never thought at that time that i would see her again and it was like it was like one of those aims for me at that time that you know i want to see her again i want to see her for the last time and it was it was a really emotional moment for me and for uh, for my family. Uh mm-hmm. yeah, so as I said like the starting days were really really hard for me. I was going through both physical and mental pain. The physical pain was due to my injuries and uh the most unbearable pain was, you know, that I had seen most of my friends dying in front of my eyes. I had seen most of my teachers die, dying. Sorry. And it was it was it was really unbearable for me. I would have nightmares. I wasn't able to sleep. I couldn't sleep. Like the first few months were probably more harder than the incident day itself. Like it was because I was I was I was totally in a traumatic situation and I didn't know what to do. I was I would cry. I would I would ask my mom because the friends that I didn't know about who got killed in in the attack some my family and the doctors they would hide like the laptops and the uh, social media and everything from me so that I don't get to know about my other friends and my teachers but I was still curious to know so uh one day when I was sitting in my room and when they shift me I spent almost like 20 to 30 days in ICU and then from ICU they shift me to the uh to a room and uh they I was I was there and in the room i was i was sitting on my bed and i was i was because there would be like someone from my family members would be with me and it, whether it would be my my sister or my brother or my mother or my father or my cousin they would always be with me because the doctors told them you know that they shouldn't leave me alone or they shouldn't like you know let me go into like you know go on the internet and search for like the things so uh when my mom went to I still remember my mom went to get some me- uh, because the nurses would come and give me medicine so my mom went to talk to the nurses and the doctors in there and I was left alone in the room so I was left alone with the phone and I was so curious and I searched it on the internet that I was like I searched about the incident that how many people and list of people who died in the attack and the list I saw all of my friends were in there all of my best friends were in there and that just broke me down i was like because a few days before that day one of my friends elder brother he came in to meet me and his brother was my best friend and i i asked him about him i was like how is he because i didn't knew that he he got killed in that attack and they were hiding this from me so he told me yeah yeah he's fine and i was like why didn't he come to meet me and he was uh-huh. like uh he was like no uh he had he had some work and he was busy that's why he didn't came to meet you uh-huh. and uh i was like yeah i was like just say my hello to him when you meet him and i was like, and when i got to know about that that just mentally broke me down again like i was like the best friend yeah i was like this 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 is not what's happening in my life what has happened to my life i started crying and i was like why what have i done to the, like i started cursing those terrorists i was like what have we done to them why did they do a, do this to us why did they kill my friends 
why did this shock me? Like, what have I done to them? Have I ever, like, harmed their kids? Have I ever done anything new to them? We were just there to study. We didn't go there to fight any terrorists. We didn't go there to, to do, like, any activities again. We just there to study. We just there to get a good future. And they took away my childhood. They took away my friends. They took away everything from me. I was crying, and I, was, I, was, I, I just had this anger inside me against them and I, I i was i was really really like getting angry at them and i was i was, I was at that time like things were going in my mind i, w- I was thinking like yeah i would i would i would grow up and I, w- I would go on and i would kill their children if they can kill my my friends i would grow up and i would join military i would join forces and i would kill them i would destroy their homes the way they did to me i would take away their lives but my mom came in and I was crying and she saw me and uh, she told me this thing. She, she, at first she started crying with me, but at that time after that she told me this thing. She was like, what will happen if you cry now? Will your friends come back? And I was like, no. Then she was like, it's better that you should get better as soon as possible and do something for them that everyone can remember them forever and you should keep them alive in the hearts of people and I don't know that you know when you are when you are so down and when someone gives you that kind of thing it, it strikes you really hard and that thing struck me really really hard and I just I was like yeah I'm, I'm, I was like from that day on I never cried like wow. uh, I, I was like I'm not gonna cry anymore because I just lost you know the, there are times in life where there's a limit to pain yeah I have been pain of my life so you know even if if i see some more pain in my life now i I cry really really before this incident i was i was really sensitive i was really really sensitive but i would even cry if if i get like less than 90 percent and i I would i would start crying about my results and all that because I, i was i was really really sensitive i would cry if someone shouts at me i would start crying and this completely changed you in your life. It really changed me. I didn't know that I would, this would make me this, like, you know, sometimes we don't realize that how much strong we are and how much determined we are. But, you know, uh, we, we are stronger than we believe and braver than we think. And but, you have so much strength. I mean, to go through what you went through, to st- to fight to stay conscious throughout the entire ordeal of losing blood and the pain that you were dealing with. I mean, that is so much strength. Oh, it's incredible. So much. And no, but I, the time. Uh-huh. Uh, sorry. Uh, we yeah, with, yeah with, the, with the passing time, you know, my things starting, although I will never ever forget that day. I will never ever be able to recover from that. That that's that's a reality of my life. You know, you can't recover from that. I, I have accepted that already. Like, you know, even if time will change, my priorities will change, but this thing will always be with me. This trauma, it's it's really hard to get over it. It's been five years. I still sometimes have nightmares. I still have, I still think about my friends, but you know, with time, you still recover a little bit because as they say, time is the best healer. And as time was going on, my thinking was changing. I was, uh, you know, one day when I was thinking, I was in hospital and I was thinking about my thoughts about having thoughts about those terrorists, you know, the anger I had for them, the the rage I had for them, the and, uh, you know, the, the want for revenge, like, you know, to avenge my friend and to take my revenge. It was somewhere in there. But then I was thinking, like, what if I do that? What will happen if I grow up, I join forces, I kill their kids? Tomorrow, their kids will grow up. They will kill my kids. Then my kids will grow up. They will kill their kids. And this war will be going on for generations. Yeah. So it's better to find a permanent solution to this thing. To, to you know, eradicate terrorism from its roots. And what is that solution to you? I think the best solution, in my opinion, for that was... Because I was thinking, why did they target my school? Because they are scared of education. They don't want kids to get educated. They know if these kids get educated, they can't brainwash them anymore. They can't increase their armies. If you educate their kids, if you educate them, they can't brainwash anyone then. And I think like 
with guns and bombs, we can only kill a terrorist. But with education, we can kill terrorism. We can kill their ideology. You know, no. terrorism is an ideology. They're not scared of bombs and guns. They, they always have that. They, they, they will fight. They're being brainwashed and they're ready to die. If someone is with that mindset that, you know, I'm going to die, you can't really do anything about it. So you have mm. to target their ideology. You have to eradicate their ideology. You have to change their minds. You can't change them. You can't finish them with guns and bombs. You can yeah. only finish them with education. You can only finish them if you change their way of thinking. Wow. If you change their minds. And yes. that's what I was thinking. I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow up. I'm going to spread the message of peace. I'm going to spread education. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop more children from being... I'm going to stop another Walid Khan, like, you know, uh, another such incident from happening. I won't let any child suffer like me. I won't let any any person suffer like any families the way my family suffered. I won't let any family suffer like that. I won't let my the way my friends suffered. I won't let anyone's friends suffer like that. And that's when I started speaking, and that's when I started doing talks. And uh, the first time uh, I did, I was when I joined school here in uh, in Birmingham because I was I was almost I was in hospital for almost two years. And so you missed two years of school in that time. Yeah, I missed two years of, of schooling at that time. And Pakistan Army, like they sent me to UK for treatment. And I was I was almost in uh, for two years in the hospital. And uh, I mean, it was being in a hospital is like being in a jail. So <laughs> yeah, it was it was quite a worse <laughs> experience for me. Hmm. And uh, I was I was I was. So like I, w I would see because the do there was uh, a threat of infection and the doctors won't allow me to go outside. So they were like, uh, they would give me toys. They would give me like iPads. They would give me everything, you know, they would bring, there were doctors that would bring posters for me. That would bring like, you know, I love cricket. They would bring cricket posters for me and iPads and PS4. But mm -hmm. I didn't really want that. I just wanted to go outside and, um, uh, the moment uh, after two years when uh, I was like discharged from hospital, I was I still I still uh, I'm still having uh, regular appointments and checkups, but the the doctors discharged me from hospital, and uh, so uh, and you were able to go back to school after that yeah, point. Yeah, after, after that, after two years, and you're going. You went to the uh, University of Birmingham school. Yeah, uh, I asked, actually, I asked Malala's father, uh, Malala, because uh, she was also really uh, supportive and her family was really supportive with me. And I asked her father uh, that, you know, uh, I want to join a school in here. And he was like, yeah, then he helped me to get admission in, in the University of Birmingham School. And when I went to that school, because it was all of a sudden, it was a totally new experience for me. Yeah. And okay. I was I was really scared because I haven't faced the world like for two years, almost. Uh, although I would see my family members, my family friends, I would see, sometimes I would see the people from media, they would come and like, you know, they would try to get interviews, although the military, when I, even when I was in military hospital, the military won't allow them to come inside but you know a few of them would have access and they they would somehow c come and take interviews so uh although i would meet people i would i, I used to meet different people from in hospital but not outside the hospital like you know the social activeness and like you know socially so i didn't uh had the experience of that for two years and when i went to school i was a bit nervous and i was like I was really, I was really scared because mm -hmm. the thing that happened to me was in a school and I was really scared to, yeah. but I was also on the, on the other side, I was also really determined and really happy to join school. I never loved school and I never felt so happy in a school before because as a teenager, before this incident, I used to hate school. But, mm -hmm. yeah. but after that, after that, when I saw school for the first time, you know, I was, I was, I was really, really happy to see a school. I was really, really happy. And why and, do you think that? Why do you think that you were happy after that incident to go to school again? Because that was, that was one of the reasons 
they they shot us for for going to school. That was one of their reasons to stop us from getting education. That, that was their aim to to scare us, to deprive us from our rights, to deprive us from education, and they wanted to produce terror in our hearts so that you know we never go back to schools. And and when I went back to school, when I started that school, I, I was I was actually feeling uh, a sense of like you know empowerment. Power. Yeah, and empowerment. Yeah, that I did absolutely. It. I, I was like, at that time, I, I felt like I have defeated them 50%, like, you know, I have won the war 50%, but there's still 50% that, that has to, like, you know, go on for, for my whole life, and I had to uh, do that. The 50% is still going on, but, yeah, when I, when I went, when I put my first step in a school, that was when I won the 50% of the war, and... <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm coming back to school in your face. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, what do you feel that the um, education, what role do you feel education plays in your purpose in life? I think education uh, has a really, really big role in my life. And not only in my life, in, in life of every uh, person and every, every student, like... Uh, Every, every young person, like every human being, education teaches you the basics of humanity. Because people who get educa education is not only about getting like degrees and like, you know, passing out as a doctor, passing out as an engineer, passing out as a journalist. Or it's not only about that. Education is about building up on your character, building up on the, uh, you know, the virtues that you get education like the character virtues that they give you and uh, it, it, it makes you like education in my opinion makes you a, a full human being a proper human being it teach you it teaches you the proper basic uh you know rules of humanity and how a human being should be uh, and and why do you just why do you think why do you believe this is important be because for every young person this is, as I said, this is the only way we can eradicate terrorism. It's not only about terrorism. Education is the only way we can eradicate poverty. We can empower people. We can empower our girls. Because there are millions of girls around the world. You can see them in developing countries. They're not getting education. They're being deprived from their, from their rights. Which Education is the basic rights. Like, you know, like any other right, it's the basic right of a human being to get education. Absolutely. And, and of every young person. And that's what I've been saying in every of my speech. Whenever I do a speech, whenever I give a motivational speech, a speech here, I always tell the students in, in here, and I think that will also go for the students in America, that these students, mm -hmm. they're so lucky and they're mm -hmm. so fortunate to have and to be living a life like that because millions of children around the world, it, this, this kind of a life, this kind of a life is only a dream for them. They yeah. can only dream about a life like that. And they, the, the best thing that they have is peace. Peace is one of the, and peace will only come with education because when, when you educate a certain amount of people in your society, when you educate your girls, when you educate your boys, when you educate, when you give them equal rights, and when uh, you give them education, then there will be no need of picking up guns because not giving them education, education will create more opportunities for the youngster. They will create, it will create more opportunities for the youth. If, if, if you give them education, they're gonna have more creative things to do. They're gonna mm -hmm. have they, they, their attention. They want that, you know, there will be nothing to divert or to distract them because yes. their whole focus will be on education. And, Absolutely. And, and it will be less easier for the terrorists to brainwash those students. Absolutely. Because you, when you see in, I have, as I'm from a developing country and I'm, I'm you know, the country which we call like third world countries. And you can see like, you know, in, in, in areas like, you know, in, in the countryside in there, you can see the students and you can see like, you know, the boys and the girls not going to schools. And if, if a person is not going to school and if he's living in a certain area, in a certain environment, and it's really easy for the terrorists to brainwash them because they have no idea about the outer world. 
they haven't seen the the people in 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 you know from outside the, the the their zones they they're just living in their own like you know world and their own zone and terrorists wants that they want those and those kind of kids and those kind of children are really vulnerable to them because they're really easy to brainwash they yeah. show them they show them these images of like you know uh, these fake images of uh uh like uh, you know the western world is doing this in the countries the western world is killing your brothers and sisters yeah. and you should get up and you should do something for it you should stop it they're raping women they're raping children and they're doing this and they're doing that and you know it's it's kind of brainwash those kids they keep on brainwashing them there and then they they you know the the thing that education has given me and that my teacher has given me is also teaching me the right way of religion like you know the religion that they taught me the religion that my parents taught me and the, the religion that I got from them was like in Islam if you kill one human being or if you harm one human being it's in Quran it means you have killed the whole humanity if you do one good deed with one human being it means you have done a good deed with the whole humanity and that's the Islam I have been learning from my teachers and from my school and from my parents but terrorists they 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 have they have made their own religion they live in their own world and they they brainwash children those children in the name of religion because religion is a really vulnerable topic the vulnerable thing it's it's the key and it's the main weapon for them to to brainwash those kids and i i can i can like you know i can answer back to them and i can stop them from brainwashing me because I have the education I have read Quran I have read Quran with translation I have uh, I have been getting other ways I have been getting like other education I've been reading books I've been reading books from different writers and I've been learning about the world I I'm, I I used to watch news and you know you have idea about the world what's happening around you but with mm-hmm. those kids they have no idea they they just they they know no better area. Yeah. yeah and it's really easy because the terrorists they they used to use in there they used to use one verse from the Quran which was like oh oh uh it was it, it says something like that oh muhammad you should kill these non muslims like you know mm. but they didn't read that you know that verse fully it was that was like you know they just use this verse and they just tell them like look it's in quran they're saying you should kill these non muslims and they all though they're killing muslims they're claiming that we are also non muslims people who are getting education they are non muslim they claim that and uh because they have their own religion they they're yeah. not muslims they're not they they don't have anything to do with religion they have their own religion which is terrorism they only have one religion that yep. is terrorism and terrorize the people and uh you know as i said like that was fully means it says like you know oh, oh muhammad you should you should defend yourself in your defense mm-hmm. even in your defense you can kill them but you should not like you know hurt children and women but you can only defend yourself in a war zone even if it if it's a war then then you can do it yeah but not th- yeah and i i love that and i i love that you bring this point up about education being a big big piece of spreading peace because of the fact that when you educate yourself you are fighting ignorance and you're fighting this this fact that people can be easily manipulated you know and controlled when they don't know any better and so the education component of that is very important for people to progress as like just people as a people together and to combat these these ideas that are not true but that people adopt because they don't know any better and i wanted to ask you when it comes to yourself and your message and and coming out into the world and sharing your story what do you believe is your purpose in life um uh, you know before this incident uh i always say this thing that uh, i only want you to live for myself and after this incident now i want to live for others and that's what education has taught me and that's what life and these experiences have taught me like you know this incident has given me something more than pain and agony it has given me self determination patience and it, it, you know with you know meeting different people learning a lot of things from them it has given me a lot more and you know i believe that you know 
we all the youngsters and all the youth, we should not take th- things for granted like you know we should we should never take things for granted that's what i always tell the 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 youth here that you know real happiness lies in gratitude and if you are grateful for the things you have you will be happy and if you're not grateful and if you're ungrateful because you should always look up to the people below you when they don't have anything and you have everything you should be grateful for whatever you have always and uh that that makes you you know feel a sense of happiness you feel that inner happiness and inner satisfaction and uh me uh the aim of my life is now to to live for others to live for those kids to live for the kids who are deprived from education who are deprived from the their basic rights uh, and uh you know what i believe is you know that above all religions all caste culture racial differences there's only one thing which is humanity humanity is the most important thing and you know we all come in you know I, i believe that humanity is like a religion and all the 7 7 billion human being or i guess like approximately 7, 7.3 billion human beings we all come in that one religion we all like this is the only thing we we all like you know come together mm-hmm. as one community as human beings because mm-hmm. in, in nowadays we often see human beings but we see we don't see humanity and that is the thing we have to you know uh there was a point uh uh there there is a point in in uh, i used to love his poetry in pakistan and he says something like that you know you know he said like uh, it's better like you know to be an a human being rather than being an angel because he was mm-hmm. like i would prefer to be a human being than being an angel mm-hmm. because that's you know we don't understand the total meaning of human being human being means kindness compassionate and all those character virtues that one can have this is what makes us human beings this is what makes us different we and we have to take care of the things around us this is our responsibility mm-hmm. if we have been given something this we should not take anything for granted like you know and uh not even like like not even the things on earth like sometimes you know we because of us we 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 causing global warming we causing many things but you know we should always like you know take care of the surroundings around us and always you know aim to serve humanity always do it for a social cause apart from like you know looking at it as a religious per- perspective or a communal perspective we should see it in a broader way which is in a humanity way like you know human humanitarian way and we should always like you know do that in that for that in that kind of like with that kind of mindset absolutely i wanted to ask you when it comes to that how do you think that society can be a part of this mission of of doing it for humanity doing things for humanity and and for each other and and in the side of love and having these amazing values you how know, can uh, society be a part of that i think they they can be a part of that everyone can be a part of them by playing their own roles mm-hmm. like the youngsters they can play their own roles by getting quality education mm-hmm. and then using that education in a better way to serve their country to serve their people and mm-hmm. to serve humanity for elders it's 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 like to playing their own role in the society like doing good things helping others and yeah uh paying taxes to the government on time and uh <laughs> yeah don't don't yeah don't, don't uh, hide your taxes don't hide yeah. your economy yeah? yeah and how yeah because that those taxes help people they they come back to the people mm-hmm. in in the form of services to them so and the politicians also have a role like to serve people honestly to be truthful to them and to be uh, i guess uh, i'm saying that yeah. one <laughs> yeah Absolutely. but you know let like, we should always hope for the best but you know and the doctors the engineers and all, all of us has a role to play in the society yeah. and if we play that role if we are honest in our in our profession mm-hmm. if we are doing it compassionately if we are doing it honestly and if we are doing it with more passion we are yeah. playing our role in the society and yeah. we 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 are helping our society to a better to be a better society if we are not racist 
towards each other if we don't have this mindset of like superiority or inferiority so we 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 can serve the society in many different ways you can you can help on like you know you can help even that's that's serving like you know doing small and small and good things like you know small things like you know uh waking up early in the morning helping your parents helping mm-hmm. your neighbors these kind of small things also comes in that you know it's not yeah. like you know you have to do something big like you know like Nelson Mandela did or like Martin Luther King did or like <laughs> Mah- Mahatma Gandhi did you know everyone has to do those kind of big things you can do small small things which yeah. can, which can help and you know those small things will combine together and it will make exactly. something more big absolutely and that's part of this whole being human right like these smaller things that we can do to contribute to the quality of our own lives the quality of the lives of the, our neighbors and it's just even giving a smile like when you're passing by a stranger during the day. You That's know, I, I think that also, I mean, the education point that you made is so important because people of all ages should be, should have that, should look into education also, I feel, in the, in the aspect of knowing what's going on, being aware, being aware of what's going on in, in society and in the world, like, these problems and issues that are arising that like global warming and like inequality and um, a lack of, of access to education in developing countries, like these things that um, we should be aware of because who knows, we might be able to make a difference there that we wouldn't have known of if we didn't do, if we didn't do that research, if we didn't, if we weren't aware. Um, So that was a very, I really appreciate you bringing up the point about education because it's so important. And I wanted to ask you, Walid, now in regards to where you are now, five years later, what activities are you involved in uh, in your current day, uh, like in your personal life or in school that you are proud of? So I was um, right now, uh, recently, uh, before summer vacation, also became the head boy of my school like, for this school, the new school. And, uh, and uh, uh, I, 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 do, I do quite a lot of activities, like extracurricular activities apart from school. Uh, I do, as I said, I do motivational speeches. I go to different schools and universities and I, I do speeches on radicalization and uh, uh, I just do insp- motivational speeches in different events. Sometimes people invite me to different events and I do motivational speeches there. And mm-hmm. I also do a lot of voluntary work. And uh, I used to be a part of Aspiring Youth Council. And uh, because of my GCSEs going on right at the moment, uh, uh, I was uh, I had to leave it and because I couldn't attend it because of my studies. And mm-hmm. um, this is my final year of GCSE. So I wanted to concentrate a bit more on my studies. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, recently, I also joined an, a new campaign, which is I Will Campaign. And it, it was it, it's an official campaign. I think it was launched by Prince Charles in the UK and a lot of youngsters wow. getting involved in that. And I was I'm also one of the ambassadors for it now. So that's uh, amazing. Uh, and yeah, I'm having uh, some speeches in the future as well. That, uh, which means uh, I, I will also travel abroad for some of my speeches, and wow. also in the UK. So yeah, there's there's a lot a lot more coming in the future. Hopefully. Absolutely, that's really amazing. Looking forward to it. Absolutely, that's amazing. And you're 17 years old now, or 18? I'm 17 years old. You're now. 17. So moving forward, you have a lot coming your way. But moving forward, what issues? Um, are you interested in focusing on to influence change? Um, and do you have any specific areas where you feel reform is needed the most? I think there, there are, like, obviously there are many areas which need reforms. But uh, in my opinion, from, for, for, from my personal experience, I think one of the things that's arising much more is radicalization. And, you know, and the other thing that is, like, you know, equal education for girl, for for girls and for boys like equal rights and equal education so these these are the two issues that 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 are one of the main focus and they they can be kind of like you know combined together because they both come in 
like you know giving them equal education and uh, radicalization you can also come overcome that with education but you know most of the times you know even though if you uh, educate certain people like you know like even students here they're getting radicalized like a lot of youngsters here that's why i started doing speeches in school because they don't really uh, youngsters they sometimes they're really vulnerable like you know to to being like you know get manipulated or to be radicalized so it's sometimes like you know you have to you if you speak to them in a way if if a certain person speaks to them who who has experience or who has been through that incident uh they really listen to you and they really get inspired by that and for that i'm really grateful to, to them to be honest because uh uh, when I was doing my first speech, uh, I wasn't really expecting anything like, you know, the 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 reaction and the response that I got from that. I wasn't really expecting that. Uh, the first speech that I did in my school, uh, I got a standing ovation. And uh, I was I was I was really surprised because uh, I didn't I didn't uh, it was I was so nervous to speak tell my story it was the first time i was publicly telling my story wow. and to to a, to a wide range of audience and mm -hmm. uh yeah when i when i did it uh i felt really good and this, the the response i saw from the people like the youngster in my school they all was so nice and so kind and so friendly and they could like you know they could empathize like it, it felt like they could although they haven't been through that experience yeah. But they were they're still like, you know, giving me that thing that you know that, that they could I was feeling like they could empathize with me because yes. they, they were crying and mm. I, I wasn't I was expecting that, that, that kind of a reaction. And wherever I go, I'm really thankful to wherever I speak, uh I I'm really thankful to the people like, you know, that they listen to me and they they, 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 they get inspired by it. So it gives me like, you know, happiness that you know i I'm my story can change someone's life my if i say something that can have an impact on someone's life so that that kind of gives me like you know that kind of satisfaction and that kind of happiness that you know mm. i'm do, at least i'm i'm playing my role i'm doing something that i was aiming for and i'm bringing a little bit of change in someone's life even Absolutely. even if they are like I, I would be i would i would really be happy if even if they if i'm speaking to a group of 500 people and if even if i'm not able to inspire those 499 but if even if i'm able to inspire one of them that will be success for me absolutely that's incredible you're doing a fantastic job and i'm so excited to see where you go because okay. you're going to you're going to truly truly impact a lot of lives and thank you so much to finish up this interview, Walid, I just wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to be here today to share your story of strength and resilience and for sharing your message of peace. Oh, and, thank you so much. You know, and I, me. Absolutely. And I'm truly, truly happy that you have found your purpose in helping the lives of others. And I truly look forward to the wonderful things that are yet to come for you. Oh, thank you so much. It was it was uh, a pleasure and honor and really nice talking to you. And thank you so much for listening so patiently. And, yeah, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And I'm really looking forward to to the interview being cast online. So. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Truly. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it and feel inspired and would like to be a part of the Relentless Minds community, you can join the movement for change on Instagram and Twitter. We would also love to know how your experience has been as a listener. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join us next week for another powerful story. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.